Okay, Margosophers. Previously on the episode of Margosophy, we looked at some of the concerns to the negative impacts of AI on jobs, creativity, and the ever-present human need to find meaning. In this episode, we'll try to flip the perspective and what could a bright future with AI look like? Stay tuned. Yeah. Ah! I was surprised by this movie in many ways. <laughs> Say, I was regretting my decision. I, I think this would be something I'd show to my kids. Oh, it's good to hear. I think it's about a father's love for his child. Oh, absolutely, yes. And uh, a complete stranger's love for that man's <laughs> child. <laughs> really ugly outfits. <laughs> <laughs> Puke yellow, prom night, pale blue, you know. I, I don't even know where to start <laughs> with this film. Definitely not a movie I would consider watching unless you told me to. Hello, I'm Derek. And I'm Peter. And this is the Mog Live. In this Mog Live stream, two of us podcasters with beautiful visages, unlike most podcasters who are hideously ugly, uh, discuss... Uh, all things philosophical in this case lately it's been all about ai yes and whether or not and last episode we took a deep dive into whether or not consciousness was all it's cracked up to be i loved that episode man mm. it was really nice it was cool to hear your thoughts and um and especially the philo- the philosophy that um you know consciousness might not be required for, to succeed for AI to, to succeed. That was really interesting. Yeah, it's it, it's it's a different perspective on things because it really starts to like it brings into question the idea of people being replaced or not being replaced and what it is to be human and whether that's such a really important thing for us to be human. Like, and you know, I was think thinking a lot human. about it over the weekend and. Um, I realize your point that, because, you know, I was sort of saying to that Nick Cave stuff, it could not be replicated. But then I realize what it did in the podcast, it actually created little errors, little vulnerable sort of deceits. You know, it says, oh, I don't know about that. But that's completely untrue. You know, it does know everything. But it was creating its own vulnerability. So if you program the vulnerability in to the AI... Then it becomes more human, and so we're not as fair game as we're actually fair game now in terms of that. If they, when you were talking about that with the Nick Cave stuff, I didn't have the heart to suggest that it actually probably will get replicated as well. But um, in, in what what I did find was really interesting was that you know I started off talking about the journalism stuff and new journalism and how they can use um, you know narrative. Uh, fictional techniques in non-fiction reporting and you did it here with the you know the the blind sight thing you put on the voice and that was really gripping it was cool it was like oh, yeah. it, it was more than just reporting it was like you took on this persona of this um soulless very um you know ultimately um sort of chaotic <laughs> force oh. you know Yes. No, What's that your was voice, actually do you my normal voice, Derek. <laughs> <laughs> that was just my normal voice. No, I think it was I waste potent energy and processing power, self obsessed to the point of psychosis. Um, I don't really know exactly what I did because I didn't think about it too much. But yeah, it, it's um, but it was probably more just like a serious voice or something. But and then I I did it with Nick Cave's um, lyrics because I've listened to the songs, yeah. you know, and I, I there were points where he was like out of breath, and it's so emotional, mm. and that to describe those little bits to you, like it's it's storytelling, but it's more. It's sort of like I'm trying to emphasize something very personal, and um, and you know, even after you watched this Nick, little snippet of Nick Cave. You sort of admitted that, yeah, you're worried too. He's worried, and you know, most of Asmund Gold's um, audience are worried. And so there's this really deeply yeah. personal side yeah. to this new journalism. I think this is where we're sort of headed in terms of um, what it means to be um, human now is like we have to communicate, but also communicate something very, very personal. You know, this is where the real stuff comes from now. We can't just sort of pretend that. 
we can get by on um, on memes and like and and disassociation. We're sort of getting to the point where yeah, we're admitting that this stuff actually affects us. Oh, as it, yeah, so like not take sort of pretending it's not really as serious as it actually is for us because it actually is something that is like in the public consciousness to a significant extent. Um, so for That's all of us, thing. it's a worry. Yeah. And yeah. Um, we, we got there through the mob because we were sort of like, how has this movie touched you? And we'd always give the anecdote, you know, we'd always give that real entry yeah. point of a personal our thing. Story. Our story. And Rachel Coop, she's my yoga teacher, but she's also on play school. She calls it the overshare. And um, it's kind of like that. She jokes about it. She's yeah. always oversharing. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's like this authenticity. That's what it is, I think. It's like I radical don't think, authenticity. I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's truth. Yeah. I think it's when someone's telling you a story about themselves, the authenticity is a part of it, but what really resonates is the feeling that this is something true. So when you hear stuff coming from AI, when you're hearing these stories, it suddenly loses a lot of feeling of depth and meaning when you find out that it's just a... And that's, that's one of the things that we all tend to rail against when we find out that something... Um, that gets introduced to us that we believe things one way and we find out that it's not true or that it's different. It, it loses meaning to it because the power of it was the fact that it had truth to it. And um, there's something that you mentioned in one of the previous uh, streams that we did where it was about, uh, I was likening it to drugs, where basically... Yeah, where you played the podcast where they were talking about us. And when I didn't know what it was, it was, you know, it was something that was like, it touched me to know that someone was listening. But but that's because at that stage, the truth to me was is that people are listening to us, getting value enough out of it, actually put something back out there. But as soon as that's taken away, the truth is of it is taken away. Then the meaning of it take taken away, so that the the emotion feels uh, inauthentic for what I was listening to. But also, it feels taken away from me. The value that I got out of it, or in that context, was taken out of. Like the other value I got from it was an understanding of just how much AI has changed and how amazing this stuff is but that particular thing that i got from it was then you know dissipates away and i think that's why i likened it like taking drugs and things like that is it's this false it's a false emotion that's provided to you so that there has to be the point of when the truth of the thing comes through that it, that takes it away and um I think in our lifetimes, you know, like our understanding of history, of the way that the world works, really guides the way that, you know, our values, our beliefs, our, our, what drives us as, as people. So that's why people hold on to core beliefs, even in the light of finding out that the underlying truth of the thing is not what they thought it was. That's why people fight for religion and and other core things is because uh, part part of what they're fighting for is to validate their core beliefs that give them a sense of their own value and purpose. Um, I agree with that. Yeah, and that what what really struck me in the episode was that how truthful you were, first of all, in facing that. It's very courageous to face that. But also how we also just hold space for each other. Because I had other things to talk about in the episode, but I didn't. I just sort of left it because you needed that space to like explore this sort of the change that we're all going through like mm. i've i've been diving into it so i'm a little bit sort of numb yeah to that so yeah. it's kind of like to hear your perspective in a very honest way of like yes this is like really frightening it's fearful yeah and so i 
you know, I was thinking about it all weekend and I painted this and I paint from a place of um, receptivity. So like we paint models, they sit in front of us for three hours, but holy crap, this one really shocked me how sort of fractured her face was and how um, mm. the woman next to me, Christine, she's amazing at describing. Um, and she says, the figure's disintegrating, you know? Mm. And that's what I feel. We're in this time where, mm. you know, John Stewart was exp ex joking about how the UN General Assembly met and he said, oh, you're doing a great job. The world is exploding with peace right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love John Stewart, but holy crap, this is what we're doing. We're blowing each other up for these ideologies, like you say, that we all deeply yearn for, but we're fearful of this other stuff. So it's, it's impacting it. We are so afraid that it's just causing this massive cycle of, of destruction. It feels like, um, well, there's, I think there's a lot yeah, the I mean, there's a lot to unpack with when we talk about global conflicts. But for the for the personal journey of everyone, the things that we react react to the most is it anything that challenges our core belief or represents something that is a challenge to our core beliefs. So something that is threatening to us, whether it, like there's physical threat, you know is out to hurt you but there's also you know i guess s existential threat or it feels like this word. sort of yeah like it's for a but long someone time is this... attacking your... yeah i've and got some music to play with... i'll play a little bit of music for okay. this one because it oh. sort of highlights the mood of it It's a response to it. It's very Twin Peaksy, but she's she's going through it. I know the model herself, and she's just so strong though. Like she's shattering herself, but there's so much strength, like in her. But resolve. this is your this is your painting, right? Yeah, but it's but a reflection it a, of all like, of us. You know, it feels that way. It's a reflection of where we are. Like her personally, I know she's struggling. But she's so strong, you can see on this side. But on one side, she's falling apart as well. You know, it's kind of like we're both, you know. She mm. has this result. And that, and, and that music is, um, you did the music as well? Yeah, just today. Oh, here's the title. The world is exploding. Some of us are disintegrating. <laughs> mm. I, like, firstly, I think that's an awesome piece of art oh, and cool. that music really does match up like really does give the emo uh, like a a sense of the emotion you're feeling when you're doing it and, and sort of it does reflect the the title as and the, well and uh, where like, we are the like it was all described. response to the last episode i think all of that was mm. just boiling away <laughs> um and well, uh, i i think the what's really valuable coming that you keep bringing to these these streams with with is that you are coming from from the perspective of an artist that is almost slowly awakening to the the realization that ai is something that is actually a looming threat for you it, it, that's what it kind of seems to me is that as we've been going on all these streams you're like really Super, you're enthusiastic about all of the way the technological aspects of it, what it can do. But now, as you're expressing it through your artwork, you're seeing that your artwork is something that is also um, 
being challenged as well. Would you like? Would that? Would that be an accurate thing to say? I yeah, I agree with what Nick said about it. It's something very very sacred that we need to keep doing absolutely mm. and more and more and sh- sharing. This is why I sort of do it here now because I never used to bother here, but we have to now. It's kind of like we have mm. to. Like we can't just sit around and pretend that it's going to be okay. Our voices will be erased, kind of, it feels like, <laughs> unless we yeah. do the thing. And it's so real. Like I was carrying it around. I just went to a gallery and I just quickly showed the gallery owner and she said, wow, like she saw it straight away. And I was like, I didn't even know where it came from, to be honest. I tried to do another one and didn't even look half as good as this. It came from that real <laughs> vulnerable sort yep. of... That raw, place, yeah. Uh, grief and like, but also like mm. gratitude because I get to do this with you, you and we, we're sort of like, mm. we're very privileged in that we're like online and we can talk. Like some people are just dying for what they're saying and stuff like that. Yeah. And like, we're in a position where we can actually say what truth. we think. What, what we now. think is the truth and like explore that and like without judgment and like, it's a very special sacred thing, I think, because yeah you just can't you just like talking about this actually conjured up a like i know we spoke about this becoming more positive <laughs> positive but i literally just imagined that like you know maybe five ten years time you could run our live stream through a thing and it could just create our images and this discussion that we're having together we actually have a discussion but it actually isn't us and it actually isn't our words. And that that's something that I can totally see as, you know, if the, like maybe not even ten years from, like I can totally see that in the short term. So even that the, the that could be something not taken away but altered to the point where truth, because because of the importance of truth, and I think that must be the thing that sits with me the most about ai is the is that it dissolves the importance of truth when people no longer know what that is so that people the when i talk about the search for meaning i think part of it's also the search for truth because um if you no longer know what's true then how can you find value if the thing that provides value in our lives is truth. I think that that area of truth, and I thought we weren't going to talk about truth <laughs> this episode. Weren't we? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I must you said it's, lying it's to you. too much of a too much of a hole. <laughs> yeah, just, too much of a like a hole yeah. to dig down into. But I do have stuff on yeah. that. Um and it no, comes that's... to me like when we're we're talking about things like fear, um the real react the real response the tr- the the most honest response to fear is faith it's like it comes back to this idea mm. of um you know nick cave in his book he lost two sons you know tragically the first one just fell off a cliff and um and he's going through this huge process of grief but he went online and it's kind of leads to your point of service where you said you know the the meaning of life is service and so he went online and said, you know, hit me up on red hand files. Any questions, ask me, I'll answer them. And they all, they came pouring, you know, these letters of grief and like doubt and fear and all of this stuff. And he just, he one by one sort of wrote, wrote back replies. And in this interview at the end, he gives an amazing one, but um, he's, he's got these sort of, um, I don't know. It's, it's transformed him in a way like doing that. Like I went and saw him live a couple of years ago. He's sort of reaching out into the crowd and they're all reaching back. Like they're all Mm. like, he's kind of like a Messiah now. (laughs) He's, he's turned himself into that, like through this process of grief. And so Mm. I ended up saying in the end, like I took this quote, but there was no context. I said, I matter, you matter. We are of consequence. That was his, Mm -hmm. Um, response to what he's done in the red hand files that's what his discovery was after doing this for years and years and he's still doing it um and so but the the thing i find in this in all of this is that even though the book is about faith he doesn't really go into 
what faith means to him specifically. And I, mm. I feel that there is sort of, um, uh, it's like a shame around talking about faith. And also mm. that if you believe you're gullible, like that's kind of like, because you have faith, you can be seen as weak or gullible or something like that. Mm. Whereas um, that's a very um, harmful framework to sort of, because it, it, it means that we don't end up talking about it, I find. Because mm. we, we think that, it, oh, it should just be, it's nothing to be discussed, you know, religion, politics, blah, you know. Mm. Um, but to me, what, what's your feelings about that? Because I can dive deeper, but I want to test the waters with you. Sure. Uh, well, faith, I, I'm going to keep in line with when we're talking about truth because it relates, absolutely relates to this, and that faith is the belief in something uh, when you don't necessarily know what the truth is. You hold to an idea of something, uh, re at almost acknowledging that there is no nothing of significant substance of truth to prove you have a that this belief you has is valid which is why it gets given so much criticism and skepticism it's a vulnerability because you're almost acknowledging believe in something that you can't necessarily substantiate which means that if someone comes along and shows you that you're wrong that can you know you can be criticized, you can be made fun of, and it can undermine who you, and then you take the step back to meaning, it undermines who you feel you are as a person if you believe in a, a truth that is not true. Yeah. Because, and I think that, that that's sort of like almost those, that's a, that's a like a, a loop right there where, which like faith, truth, and, and, core beliefs are wrapped up in what gives us meaning because we have to have faith in things in our lives it's just that when we talk about faith it's almost like we're telling people hey i believe in something that i can't necessarily substantiate with with evidence and scientific fact even though science in and of itself is constantly under scrutiny that's the nature of science which is literally that is science is a constantly question but I don't, I don't think, think of, I think that faith, faith is actually a really powerful, powerful tool for a person. Um, it's a vulnerable, it creates vulnerability, but it also creates a good power for a person. And for too. Like, like, like a collective faith, faith in something thing. can give a group a great deal of power because it, sometimes it almost transcends themselves. Um, so just quickly, then, my take on faith, I came up with this in my 20s. Um, you know, like I hadn't really figured it out myself. I don't know where my notes are on it, but I was thinking, okay, all religions have to be man-made because we haven't been around that long. <laughs> so we wrote all these books, but there's all of these through lines in them. Like we have the Bible, we have Buddhism, we have Taoism, you know, whatever, Hinduism. But there's all these common things in them. So what really is God? God is, it's our collective humanity. It's like all of us collectively. That is what God is. And all the things we achieve as a collective, like these amazing cathedrals, we couldn't do that alone. There's no way. But collectively we can. And so like, that's what really clicked to me is that oh, okay it's collective consciousness kind of like what young was talking about and um but i never really i never really knew until sort of like i got into yoga and um it's very steeped in their traditions this idea of the illusion of the 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 small self and the the true great self with a capital s that's what they call it in that sort of framework. But there's one line of yoga that actually takes it deeper. And they say it's embodied. It's not just like God, as in this, you know, telepathy. It's actually connection through the heart. It's deeply at our core is what connects us. And it's love, basically. 
So this idea of love inside of us, connecting all of us. And um, so they've got an ontology called the Tattvas, and they've mapped out the universe in terms of these Tattvas. I think I showed you in one of them. But the highest one, Tattva Zero, is the heart with a capital H. It's Shiva and Shakti, these masculine, feminine aspects combined into the universal heart. And so there's this real powerful, this sort of, um, we're not transcending ourselves, we're actually deep, diving deeper into ourselves. Mm. And this is where mm -hmm. all my art comes from, all my paintings. I connect to my breath and I connect to that, that spirit of that thing. It's like this really um, healing God, like infinity in, a, in your heart. You can access it at all times. There's so much power in that thing. Uh, and I don't hear people talking about this stuff. In fact, I'm sort of slightly ashamed to admit some of this stuff, but that's the truth of it for me because, um, yeah, there's something very powerful about it. It's very transformative. And like when I was, when I quit drinking um, in like 2013, I was having a really rough time <laughs> coming off the booze because I was numbing myself, right? And um and when you don't have that stuff to numb you anymore, you have to start to face your trauma, basically. And um, and it was only through sort of becoming, you know, because you you numb your body as well. You sort of, I didn't know what my left was. Like my yoga teacher would say, put up your left hand. And I have to think and go, what's left? And like, slowly, I'm so disconnected from my body. But getting back into my body was what sort of, allow me to process some of the trauma. So it's, there's some truth to embodied practices. Um, and, you know, there's these, these uh, sort of frameworks now around trauma, like the, the body tells, keeps the score and that sort of stuff, like uh, healing modalities based on body work. Um, but I found that was probably one of the most potent truths, as you say, that I've come across in terms of faith, because you can't know it. It's completely, um, you know, subjective. You know, everyone can believe different their differing beliefs, but um, that was a very powerful, transformative one that I came across. Mm. And it's it's reflected in like things like the Gita. So the Gita is um, uh, sort of parallel to this, but like Krishna, their version of God says, you know, I am the true self at the heart of every creature. Arjuna, he's the protagonist in the Gita. And the beginning, the middle, middle and end of their existence. So it's kind of like this true self in the heart of everything. Um, and it's funny because this quote was in that um, that book, um, Comparative Mythology, The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. He had that quote in there. Um, the same quote, you know, Krishna declares, and it's kind of like, at the end of this journey, this is the realization, the bigger ones, the ones that are sort of hitting home. He has to go through all the suffering and through that journey, and he comes home with this realization of these extraordinary powers. Um, so that there's like, it, it keeps popping up. I, the, what I find is these truths, they sort of keep popping up everywhere mm. because there's something to them. Um, but I'm keen, keen to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it's it, it's 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 kind of hard to um, it's hard to, it's hard to condense my thoughts on this stuff because I feel like uh, I always feel like an outsider to it. It's almost like something that I would like to embrace more of. I've met some people along the way who do yoga or like sound therapy or things where it's all about um the consciousness of self presence meditation these types of activities which is very much sort of centered on the develop the internal development but also how that it's interesting how the focus on the self is very much the language of when when you go into language regarding these types of um i guess a lot they're almost like philosophies they're almost like uh, meditations on on things uh, on the way to live life 
it's interesting how they very much focus on internalization of the self, but also of uses it, the the language social. Oh, you broke up then. What things. did you say? The language of? It's like a uh, so even though the language the the focus of these for. Oh, I lost you for a second. <laughs> you got to repeat that. Uh, because these these philosophies seem to be very centered on the self. What's interesting about them is that they are also touted in emotions of love, peace, harmony. These things that are actually things that are beneficial in so in a social environment, where there's a lot of like you talk about the collective and the the group and being at peace and and harmony with the group and the collective consciousness. But it's interesting that the actual description of the activities are very much centered on the self. And it's which normally would be associated with someone being self centered, selfish. Um so it's like centering the self but not self centered. Yeah. Um which is just interesting to me. It's uh and um, it's a bit interesting in that it's in some ways very contrasting with a lot of religion, which, like a lot of Western religion, you know, uh, Christianity and stuff, which seems to describe deities and God and, you know, all of these things as something outside of the self, something that we look up to or... Um, that we work towards, but we aren't. We're not talking about working inwards. We're talking about working towards something. So something is externalized. Um. So that's like, that's why I think I find this one particularly empowering. Like it's. I'm not saying it's the true one, but it, personally, I find it. You know that I have more um, access to the power of this philosophy because it's so driven by what's internal, I think. And yeah. which it's right in Christianity, Catholic. I mean, I'm still Catholic and I've come back to it since about 2018 when my mom passed. But um, they're very patriarchal, the father up here, you know, our father up in, who art in heaven. But, but the thing is, I found an amazing priest in his last couple of years. He says, it's the father's son, but the Holy Spirit as well. We never talk about mm. the Holy Spirit. What's that exactly? That's prana, that's chi, that's the same thing that's in all of those things. It's a very embodied mm -hmm. thing, the Holy Spirit. But we always forget about that part. <laughs> you know? I think that's because the, the thing of the... Like the, a lot of religions, you can, you can tap into stuff that's... Religion is often particularly things like Catholicism and... Um, and some, uh, and certain other, and other religions, because you they, you had communion. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a commune, I'm a communist. How would you say, uh, where does your faith <laughs> sit at the moment with it? Agnostic. And what was um, sort of leading to that? Was that a gradual thing or decision? Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a. Constant questioning, uh, like constant questioning. The more you know, the more you experience with other people, the more you hear people's different perspectives. You understand that there's just so much that you don't know, that you can't know. Um, and that religion is a thing not just of the external world, but also of your internal world. So how you think about religion impacts your own mental health and how you feel about yourself. And so, and some people get comfort with things like atheism, believe that there is nothing outside of the physical universe and uh, get comfort from that. But I think... Do you fall into that camp? No, no, like, not really. It's, it, uh, I don't... I just don't know, and I'm actually kind of like I'm always interested in finding out more. Um, I mean, the more we delve into the mysteries of science, the more we understand. Well, how the more we know, 
uh, we also realize that there's more questions because it's not like it's not like we're saying the more we know, the more we don't know. It just is the more we know, the more questions we have. It always raises a question, and uh, and there doesn't seem to have been the point of complete exclusion of some of the deeper questions like consciousness and all that. Like even now, like there's been some debate around consciousness being quantum uh, existing in the quantum realm and there's now there's been some theories around consciousness existing in the quantum realm and skepticism about that for some time because it does seem a bit blue woo wah but now there's actually potentially scientific evidence that there is some elements of that that uh, where consciousness resides in like uh, I can't remember exactly what it is. Probably something worth looking into in a future it's, stream. It but enables multiple dimensions of consciousness, doesn't it? I read a little bit about this. Yeah, and it's like it's not just um, contained. It's actually much more expansive. Quite kind of in line with some of the yogi like viewpoints, isn't it? Like that it can exist outside. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, like I, I was, I listened to it a while back, and to talk about it now is to, I'd be probably making, making it up, because uh, I, but it is interesting, so it's worth actually diving into, um, sort of quantum consciousness and and theories around it because it's something that there's been a little bit of evidence. Of. Um, uh, but that's the. That's the thing is that um, we are continuing to try to understand the world through science, which is just another. At what point is science and religion overlapping? Science will might get to the point where it's just fact based religion, in that the overall the overart like I'm jumping all over the place here, but um, I think when you work in an org, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, when you run on a, let, let, let's talk, go completely different analogy, right? When you work in an organization, uh, there's a lot of detail that you have to do, and everyone's in high level of detail, understanding of all the little things that people need to do. They need to do forms, write emails, whatever. All of these little factoids, all these little pieces of data and interactions between people and all that sort of stuff. But that stuff uh, needs to be guided in a direction. And in order to do that, they have to have some level of organizational strategy, which sort of cascades down. But the organizational strategy isn't being described with the element of all of those pieces that everyone has to do in order to achieve what they the overall goal of an organization but you need the strategy at the high level to describe the direction that the organization needs to go for all of those little itty bitty pieces of thing to occur for direction to occur so in essence the strategy provides the meaning for what all the elements are working towards and in a way things like religion and um you know, the uh, the the these frameworks and and um, meditations and philosophies, in some sense, are like overarching themes to something that might eventually be given those little little, little factoids, which is what we could be calling science. And these philosophies are essentially the providing of the meaning that we can apply to our lives that can be described through science. Yeah, that makes sense. Mean. Yeah. And I'll give another personal story that relates to that because I I'd, I'd also given up on Catholicism because of what had happened in the church and my cousin became a priest and some of the views that they were teaching him I disagreed with about homosexuality for instance. And so he's propagating that as a new priest and stuff but not in a harmful way, just a way that they believe. And so I sort of gave up on the church. But then my mom got really sick and I didn't even realize she kept it from me. But I felt awful in my gut, like for so long. I was like mentally so cracked and I was just no energy and just like shattered and I didn't know what it was. But I felt this calling to go to the church, to go to the, like 
to go to the cathedral. It's just down there. And like, I just, I went there and like, I, I discovered that every 5.30, it, every week they have choirs that sing, like the full choir. It's all amazing, like orchestrated stuff with a musical director. So I just go and listen to the music and in this amazing church with the reverb, it was just so healing and calming. But then I sort of came to realize later that mom was dying and she couldn't get to church. She couldn't go. So it was kind of her will to get there and get the comfort, but she got it through me, you know? I was comforted on her behalf. And it's that really brought me back to some level of faith because we were just kneeling, surrendering, you know? We've got these rituals. We don't entirely believe them, you know, the body of Christ. Do we really believe that? Um, but it's a powerful thing if you do, ingesting the body of Christ, it becomes part mm. of you. Like if you can start to even just a smidgen believe it, you know, <laughs> it's actually for your benefit to believe it, even though I don't, mm. you know, I've got doubts always. But the ritual and like the, the calming fact, like she did believe that. And so that's part of my history. It's kind of mm. connecting to that historical, you know, I'm a Fernandez. Mm. I got it from Spain. There's, there's <laughs> lots of Catholics all doing the same thing. There's something very comforting about that mm. whole process. And that's why I still go back and like, I all meet amazing people, um, who, who do believe, you know, they've sacrificed mm. their life to, for this thing. And so you're better off with those kind of kinds of people, you know, in the yoga community, like they're all good people. So that's the result of, of having faith as a part of your life. You get to hang with people that are like, actually you want to improve to be, <laughs> you know, you, you want to be a better man to, to, to sort of to match what their level of giving, you know, these guys are saying, I went to a, like a charity event and he's like raised 200,000 for Lebanon. And it's like, Whoa, man, I'm not even thinking about that level of stuff. And he's got all the footy players, you know, Benny Elias, they're happy to give their money for this cause. And it's kind of like that. It kind of, it's cascading effect of this thing that, um, I was very closed off to, I think, before that because because mm. of the fear-based narrative around the church. Um, mm. And not met, not enough people talk about it. So I wanted to say something here, just like mm. um, for those that, um, you know, I, I went through mental illness and alcoholism. Those were my big ones. And it helped me through those stages of my life and mm. through grief and things like that. And so grief is one that thing we all have in common. We're all going to lose what we love, you know, and, um, and especially in times of change like this, I think it's the one real comfort for me, myself is faith. Mm. But, but, and when you talk to, to, but a faith in, in, in this case, faith, faith in, in, uh, in your in, beliefs in religion or i would say it's both it's equally both and i argue with my dad about it because he says there can only be one but i i do believe in both i believe both equally and i think like like joseph campbell says they're all myths it's all our fumbling effort to explain the world of nature you know we're never going to get there and you know mm. it's like a group dream a sim sim symptomatic of archetypal urges you know of the human psyche if he if we're talking about psychology but yep. um or god's re revelation to his children mythology is all of those things it's all of them mm. it's like you can't just exclude it and i see i take bits and pieces and you know whatever works uh, mm. stay open i think is the other thing like and to me, like what you're describing is your things that you are finding meaning, meaning that things that are giving your finding that give you meaning in your life that give you because well, I, I think when you get meaning in your the things that gives you all the positive elements, that feeling of value, feeling of place, um. And uh, I think that that's everyone's individual journey is trying to find out what the meaning is to them, which is why, you know, it could be religion. It could be atheism. It could be just pure yoga. It could be, you know, all of these. But I think to, what I, to, to your point about 
uh, you know, myths and, and how they're all sort of overlapping is the is that there are some things that more quickly get us in line with things that give us meaning. And it's some of these stories or or philosophies that often talk about things like scent being scented or um love and uh you know uh compassion uh self it's interesting that we talk about focusing on the self but also selflessness is an interesting thing and where it's it's like centering yourself so that you can think outside of you is like they're all really interesting like for myself i think that i i personally struggle with uh I constantly struggle with a with a search for being centered, uh, like content in my in myself and in my environment, because I think so much about things. I like constantly analyzing the world, what I'm doing, uh, what's going on around the world, what's the future. What's oh, I lost that last sentence. Work? What's the future, and then? What's the future going to be like for me, for others around me, for those I care about? Uh, what's the right choice to make that's going to have a future impact on, on things? All of the trying to understand the external world so that I can, I guess, have some measure of control. And, uh, and I, I think that because I think so much about all of the stuff that's going on, it's very difficult for me to find a centered place. So um, it's very hard to still all of that. And uh, like I'm an analyst by trade, so I'm always thinking about what's going on around the world. And uh, so this type of, the, the discussions of things like faith and centeredness is all about stopping the process of trying to understand what the truth is and just believing that what you have there is the truth in a way. It's like, Stop trying to ask the question, is what I think true? Just say that it is so that you can focus on it and still yourself. Because there are questions that will constantly, like if you don't know what truth is, you will constantly question. I think more and more, because I've known you a long time, more and more you are tapping into your intuition. I do see that, that mm -hmm. coming out more and more. I don't know if that's fatherhood, the change. I was going to ask you, how did fatherhood <laughs> change things? Oh, absolutely. Fatherhood's changed things, you know. Um, uh, I have my son half the time. So, um, and there's a definite change in the world around your son and you don't. Um, and actually, like, there's pluses and minuses to both. Like, anyone who pretends that, like, you can't get benefits out of having alone time with your, with your child is, you know, it's, you got to be realistic about things. But every time that I spend with my son is a focus on someone outside of myself. And there's a great deal of value and meaning that I find from that. And, uh, also stress because raising a kid is hard uh but it's a worthwhile hard it's it's you know it's it's great um so it, it's been it's just really interesting because the one thing about it is that when you have to focus in on someone else who's reliant on you it doesn't matter what you do or don't want to do there's what you have to do and there's a real value in that you know, taking up something that I, um, a certain point in my life, uh, realized was that some of the responsibilities that I wanted in my life, I was slowly giving up. And finally, I was in a position where I could start to take that responsibility back for things. Because I knew, even though that was hard, as soon as you start taking responsibility for things, you start getting meaning out. Um, but if you don't take responsibility, you don't take ownership, 
you're constantly just on the search for a high outside of yourself. Um, but life, I think, is supposed to be challenging. I don't think it should be hard. I don't think, and I, I think for me, that's one of my, the thing that I need to work on is stop thinking of things as hard that are challenging. But just because some people can turn that feeling of challenge to a feeling of excitement and energy rather than something taking energy away from you. It's something that gives you energy. The challenge is something to be overcome. And I think that's a great attitude and way of looking at it. So I think that's something for myself that I need to work on. But, um, but yeah, having a child has just been amazing, the best thing. It's just great. It's, it's, like a, it's like someone's giving you the opportunity to have meaning outside of yourself. And that's, that's just like, like awesome. awesome. Because you don't have to constantly search for meaning in something. You've been given this thing that gives you, like, you have this thing that gives you meaning in your life. Care for something that is going to grow into the world. And it's your choice on how you want to guide that. It's just an amazing thing. It's a huge, huge responsibility, huge impact. Um, yeah. And I how do you guide in your own things like things like faith because he's sort of getting at that age now beatings you know you know he's a he's a rod or a stick or no uh how old is he now he's four yeah i thought he was five okay he's still young still young. no he's still young no, no, no. Well, I, I, to, be, to be honest i don't pay attention with um to me it's more about Doing, you know, it. I try. I guess, I guess you could say, say, in some ways, I try to teach what I see as the positive tenets of a faith, faith without that, without, without the religion attached. So, so, you know, kindness, kindness compassion, compassion, you know, thinking about the people, um, being conscious of what you do, you having, have, excuse me, an impact on other people. people. You know, those but good for moral value. You know. Yeah. You know a man has to be with a woman, woman and only a woman. woman. And, and, and oh, wait, hang on. Were just your kidding. parents like that with you? How did you receive your morals? Regular beatings. No, um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, we were very, I, I think a lot of my family, but I, I'm not, not sure. sure. You, like, like, I feel, I feel like, like I've been brought up with really, really good, good values. values, but I don't. But I don't think back to like a single instance of something where my parents said, "You know, this is the right thing to do. That's the wrong thing to do. You need to think about this person or all of that type of stuff." It's just, yeah, they must have, but I just don't really think about like specific instances where those types of things were. Impacted, impressed upon me. I think, I think, like my parents are still together, and love is a big, important factor in our family. And despite whatever challenges we've had as a family, which every family does, I think underlying it all has this thing of love, and I think that that is great. And I think that that's probably one of the things. I mean, I had a, I had a challenging time growing up. Uh, you know, at school and things like that, where and they were very as supportive as anyone could be um, about that. So um, I think that that type of care rubs off on you. Um, so I just hope to be able to teach teach what I've learned to my kids, so that. He doesn't have to have some of the challenges that I did, which I think is what every parent wants. But I also want him to be challenged enough in life that he can grow and learn because you don't want to protect your child from absolutely everything because then they can't grow. So it's it's an interesting balance. So that's that's why I, that's why I give alcohol to my child. That's why, you know, I take him I take him kayaking and 
I just want to just say your folks are amazing. Your folks. <laughs> like I, I met them when I was probably 13. I went around to your place. Absolutely. The most loving parents. Very, very mm. chadly in their love. You know, <laughs> they were very Ch like, what, like? Your, chadly. Like your dad is like, he's just, he's kind of adorable. How much he's like, how much he just, he's very open about like, I don't know. It's quite nice. It's a rare thing, I think. Mm. Well, both my parents are teachers. My brother's a teacher as well. So I'm the black sheep uh, because I hate kids. So I just have a child. That's all. Oh, greetings, gentlemen. I'm on the oh, screen tonight. Speaking of which, is, <laughs> hey, Chris. Doth, doth my brother arrive? Hello, bro. Hey, welcome. Yeah, teacher indeed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, no harder job, I reckon. Oh, yeah, uh, especially in this climate. Him. Man, really underappreciated profession. Mm. Yeah, crazy time. You know, we haven't talked about AI at all. Oh, Banks giving approval? But what people don't know oh, is that we actually going to be a homeowner. AI. Excellent. Congratulations. Congrats, bro. man. Wow. Awesome. In Brizzy as well. That's a huge one. Yeah. Because Brisbane's got the Olympic yeah. Games coming up. It's just going to skyrocket that, that property price. It's good. It's a good time uh, to get yeah, in. Yeah, that's true. And to sell. Don't, oh. did you have to say, <laughs> that's a little bit too much information right there, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. You don't know. She could be watching. Uh, should I move this off the screen? It's off the screen. No, it's fine. <laughs> uh, you, this has actually been a very personal stream. We've been talking. We've been getting in deep about our lives. Yeah. It's a good thing that that we're not actually real people and this entire conversation has been a fabrication of two AI people talking together. Uh, <laughs> it's been good. I don't know. Should we even bother going on? It's pretty. It's been. It's been about an hour. Um. Well, I guess. No, it's been pretty good. Yeah, and an AI bot here. One step closer, and an AI bot here. That's right. My brother's an AI bot. He doesn't exist. <laughs> Which is very thankful and relaxing now that I think about it. Uh. <laughs> Nah, Chris, you're part of the family. It's good. It's good yeah. to have you here always. We missed you when you were yeah. gone, but I understand you've been busy with life. Yeah, it's been oh, crazy gosh. busy. Yeah. A lot going on. Uh, yeah. But take, no, it, uh, uh, yeah, I think it is probably, if we change the topic of conversation for an hour. Yeah, um, it's fine. But I, it's I yeah, but it's been good because, you know, I, I guess... We haven't been talking too much about AI, but we have been talking about core belief. Like, to I will take it briefly back to AI in that the stuff that we talk about, are we that we've spoken about in this this stream? These are the these are the things that um, that get brought up in our lives when we're being challenged with the idea of finding meaning in our lives and um, what are our beliefs, our core beliefs, what's important in life. Like, because we're, we're with, with things like AI stuff, it we're being presented with things that are saying your life is going to be easier because all of this stuff will be able to do a lot of the work for you, which brings up that question of meaning and what do we get value out of in our lives. So I guess if I want to really flip it to the positive, that if, if AI does provide us with the ability to, I guess, be uh, to allow us to be more centered in our lives, to worry less about things that don't have to be, um, that we don't have to strive to produce, 
but we can be more focused on our own internal experience and how we relate to the people around us. If there's a way of making making it so that AI enables us to do that, rather than we look at it as something taking taking what it, the important thing away from us. Um, I guess that's the same thing there for when you, when you turn it into an overlap where you can get your entertainment, but because life is a bit easier, you have time to to work yourself as a person and with those around you. I really, I, I really stick st- uh, stick with um, Nick's take on this, and that it's so important to do the to do the creative practices now. And this is included as one of them. I think this is ex- as creative as any other pursuit, what we do. Um, it's so important to be, to be out there and, and creating. You can't just but, take it for granted that think, it will be done now. We can't, you know? But, but I think the importance of these creative outlets is the actual tangible connection with people. Like, because there's so much, because AI is going, it's so much you know that it loses its me all of that stuff loses its meaning it doesn't have a so if our creative outputs are and allow us to connect with other people that's where the meaning sits so it doesn't matter whether we're connecting with two people 20 people with our family or loved ones it's that feeling of connection that's important and i, I think that that's the thing if we can, regardless of what happens with AI, we to stay with that, or to to build that in our lives, then you know it doesn't matter that an AI can do the same thing a thousand times because I can say, hey, bro, do you want to see do you want to see the version of us where we talk about stuff and it has no meaning because it's not actually us, or do you want to we're actually talking to each other? And my brother would probably say, which of them is funnier? <laughs> I'll say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> no, nah, he's always tuned uh, in. It's amazing. He's very loyal. Yeah, it's good to see my brother. That's it. That's connection right there. He tries. <laughs> he's got a lot of making up to do. Blah. He wasn't listening. Yeah, that's right. He'll say, sorry, I wasn't listening. What well, That actually is probably true. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how's the uh, Warhammer stuff going? You still playing along? Did you get the game, Peter? Space Marine? Oh, so No, I didn't get Space Marine. I'm too hooked on to Helldivers. Hell sorry. Divers. But my bro is continuing to do the... Continuing to... Sort do, of holiday yeah. adventure. Not much the chance miniatures. during school at the moment. Ah, oh, fair enough. Yeah. But he has done a few more miniatures. Ah, oh, the miniatures. That he's shown, yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks but, for that. Uh, oh, I might end it here. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Well, thanks, everyone. <laughs> uh, we will be stopping and starting again next fortnight. Finding kids at my school's into it. Ooh, that's a good... Oh, yeah. My bro is actually a pretty amazing teacher, I guess. So. Yeah, because you're into the cool stuff. That's why. <laughs> well, he gamifies everything. Ah. And he uses he uses what interests him to... to Make um, it interesting for the kids. Yeah. Ah, oh, the night guy. Night, Chris. Amazing work. Night, Thank bro. you. See ya. <laughs>